Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one, Winning the Ground War, written by fools like me. Ever since the Saxix army lost orbital dominance two cycles ago, they've been on the move. Sergeant Louvet rolled out the bed along with every other soldier in his barracks when the wake-up call sounded. He quickly dressed and began hiking up the mobile radar station on a nearby hill. The rest of the soldiers around him suited up and started packing up camp. Saxic are an insectoid race, keep on acquiring new resource-rich worlds, even if they were already occupied. The last offensive may have been placed in them beyond reinforcements, but they didn't mean that they couldn't hold their own. Orbital control wasn't crucial anyway. They were still winning the ground war. Extremely mobile terrestrial vehicles and galaxy-renowned camouflage saw to that. Orbital strikes were fast, but they couldn't change the course, and you can't shoot what you can't see anyway. After a night of radio silence and being hidden under a canopy of a forest, it was time to contact the other regiments. When Louvet reached the radar station, he double-checked the timetables for today's information exchange. Everything was right on schedule. Today would be an early morning rendezvous, though he couldn't see it. He knew that his fellow soldiers had packed up camp and were waiting on their vehicles in the valley below. With their eyes to the sky, the Saxic mobile forces could avoid the blast radius of a kinetic orbital strike with as little as three minutes' notice. After a brief systems check, the mobile radar was prepped to go. He picked up a two-way radio and said, Commander, are you mobile ready? Ready, came the crisp reply. Louvet fired up the antenna and initiated a signal sweep. Sir, a new radio signature just came online. How far away is it? Five minutes. Daily communication with other mobile ground forces is crucial to coordinating offensive efforts. However, using the radio exposes your location briefly until you can find friendly troops to switch to a directional antennae. One that wouldn't leak signals into space. The control board chimed, indicating a signal had been found. Louvain keyed into the mic. Good morning, this is BDFA-773 reporting in. Coming! I can't! It's moving so fast! Louvain paused as the static on the radio hissed. It wasn't uncommon to join in the middle of another conversation. But the interference was unusual. All the status indicators looked good from his end. So, it must be coming from the other radio site. He pressed the mic button again. I'm having trouble hearing you. Say again. Hostile. Prepare for... The static seemed to grow even louder, drowning out more of the world's... Object appears to be... He caught himself, holding his breath. What was that sound? Isle, dead. Preet, nuclear, miss. He jumped to his feet, compound eyes scanning in the direction of the antenna was facing, searching the horizon for the glowing mushroom cloud. Oh, gods, it's... Louvet waited. The radio continued to hiss. One minute. Two. He switched off the antenna. His growing shock at the possible loss of another regiment was interrupted by his commander. What's the status? His commander said. Normally, Louvet would have given him a sit rep by now. We must have gotten impatient. We've got a problem, sir. I think our friendlies got nuked. They're not responding. They got what? Louvet's eyes were still scanning out the window. Nuked, sir. I think we better... There was something on the horizon. It was coming in low, opposite the rising sun. The object was dark, but there was some light behind it. Could it be... a missile? Now that it's dropped, its last warhead can cruise around at low altitudes, destroying enemy regiments with acoustic shockwaves. Uncontrollably. No, we'll be directing it. The object was growing larger by the second. Either it was already on top of them, or it was moving impossibly fast. Incoming hostile, we need to go now, Louvet shouted into the radio. All units evacuate! Meet in Delta, go! The commander relayed. All through the valley, Sergeant Louvet could hear engines spooling up. He slammed a hand down on the start button and fired his own vehicle up. Quickly, he cast a glance up to check the location of the missile. With luck. The ground forces could be well on the way before. He was already here. If Louvet hadn't looked up at the precise moment, he would have missed it. 
The large fuselage of the missile streaked across the sky completely silent. It was flying so low that it could have crashed into the roof of a small skyscraper. And before he could blink, it was gone. It dropped no bombs and continued on its way. Confused, Duvet turned to look back where it came from and gasp. Rushing towards him was a veritable wall of death. A shockwave that was ripping through the land, tossing trees and vegetation aside with vengeance. He pulled the controls hard to get out of the way. All at once, the sound crashed over him and rendered his vehicle and the valley below. Several alien war officials and aides were standing around a control center in stunned silence. The Alliance had asked humanity for help to end this war. But this... And uh, how is this thing powered again? One of them asked. The human military general smiled. Fusion is a fusion-powered scramjet. But how do you convert the electricity to thrust? We don't. We simply expose the fusion core to the atmosphere inside the scramjet's combustion chamber. At high speeds, the air combusts and provides thrust. The old alien general muttered, Never seen anything that large fly that fast in the atmosphere. The human continued. It flies around in Mach 10 or so. He glanced at his aide. Did that translate? She nodded. It has enough fuel to fly for a few weeks, but uh, we can ditch it early if necessary. At this rate, we will run through the remaining enemy forces in the next couple of days. Uh, how many more of these does uh, humanity have? The general smiled. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid that's classified. End of story. Story number two. The Crazy Iron Stomachs of the Human Race. Written by Louis Le Diamond. You know what I love doing? Trying various cuisines and foods from various races around the galaxy. From the Gorathon of Alipanthia to the Articulatiums of the Horantitatataud, the galaxy has its fair share of delicious dishes. But none are quite as delicious or potentially deadly as the various dishes from Earth. For example, a popular drink among humans is coffee. It's a brown bitter liquid with caffeine as a key ingredient. That's right. One of the most deadly poisons in the galaxy is something humans consume a lot. It's and a hefty amount of their drinks besides coffee too. For them, the effects of caffeine vary. For neurotypical humans, caffeine acts as a stimulant like a booster for their brains. Similar, in fact, to the oh-so-infamous adrenaline. For humans with a neurodivergency known as ADHD, however, it helps calm them down and control their energy levels. Humans also consume plenty of capsaicin. You know, the stuff that literally sets some people on fire. Yeah, that stuff. Humans throw it in some of their foods for, uh, fun. It has no health benefit. They just, uh, like the pain of it. Seriously. Humans are a weird bunch. But they also have plenty of various delicious food that are safe for all the races to eat. One of my favorite is that I'm eating as a type of this is a dish popular in North America on Earth known as cornbread. Bread is humanity's foundation food, that food type that helped kickstart civilization with its energy-dense makeup. Cornbread is a variation of it with cornmeal, a product made from vegetable known as corn, or sometimes maize, as a key ingredient. Yet alongside many breads, such as banana bread and garlic bread, which is also unfortunately toxic towards most life, are extremely popular. That bread itself is present in almost every human meal. Humans also enjoy a variety of drinks, such as tea and coffee. Both are extremely popular, but due to caffeine present in most teas and coffee, are potentially lethal for most sentients. Along with soft drinks like soda, also referred to as popped, has hard drinks like beer, whiskey, and wine. The hard in hard drinks refers to the drink containing another highly toxic chemical known as alcohol. Humans get high off of the substance and can die if too much is consumed. This chemical impairs their judgment and their mental and physical facilities. That's right. They actively ingest chemicals that put them in harm's way. Human dishes also include many non-toxic foods too, however. Rice, the most popular food, along with vegetables such as carrots, corn, and potatoes, are extremely healthy for most sentients. Same with the uh, fruits. 
a unique food group to Earth that are jam-packed with the oh-so-precious natural sugars. In fact, Earth is the number one supplier of galactic natural sugars, hence the sweet boom when they were introduced to the galaxy. After the Second human Kanalanti War, these fruits and vegetables have become mainstays of human diets, and are grown on all planets suitable and owned by humanity. Or its select allies, like the Potitharians, who were suffering a mass famine before Earth gifted many of its crops to the planet. Needless to say, Earthling cuisines have seriously reshaped the diets of many citizens of the galaxy. But Earth's food will can always be a gamble of delicious delicacies or poisonous last meals. This has been your favorite food blogger and chef extraordinaire, Garthak, wishing you a bon appetit. And as always, goodbye and uh, good night. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click, click, click. With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I just quickly want to thank the tier 5 patrons and channel members. Alithia Barkey, Ken Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Albard and Gusta, Arcadian, Lord Azrakal, and Joe Kambaka.